If you have your Bibles with you, open up to 2 Kings, 2 Kings chapter 4. It's right after 1 Kings. That's right. Extended version. 2 Kings chapter 4. It's right here. towards the beginning a little bit. It's like 20% through the, through the Bible. 2 Kings chapter 4. We are talking about our homes. What I mean by our homes is, I mean, where we really live, not just like your house, but the reality of your, um, your personal and kind of intimate life, the patterns of, of living, things that you're doing, and also the sphere of influence of the people that you have in your immediate circle of uh, of friends or family. And we're, we're going through the scriptures and talking about the various ways that God has shown us, instructed us, that we can make room for God by doing physical things. We can make a place. You can make a place for God in your life by doing things. This is meant to be an encouragement after having talked about how Physical things that we do can make a place for the enemy, these evil spirited beings who take advantage of things that we do in the physical. Um, But the hopeful kind of uh, inverse of that is you can also do things in the physical realm, doing things with your hands, your mind, your, your life, that can make a place for God. The phrase that I'm using is um, making room for the word of God makes place for the work of God. When you make room for the word of God in your life, it makes a place for the work of God. We're going to be reading an episode here. It's very short. Um, we're, we're going to be reading an episode about a woman who made room for the word of God in her life. And that made a place for the work of God in her life, even though she was in very dire straits. She was in a really, really bad way. And so the concept that I'm hoping to bring to you is how do we make room for God in our need? When we have need, where we have need, how do I make room for God in that place? Do I want to make room for God in that place? And then, you know, what does it look like? So 2 Kings chapter 4, we're going we're gonna to read it in just a second, but I want to give you a little bit of a backdrop of what was going on in Israel at that time because it wasn't great. This is after King David, after King Solomon, after the Golden Age, and many kings had, had, um, had risen to power in between the golden age of Israel and now, and things weren't going great. So much so that the nation had split. There was the nation of Israel and then, and then Judah. And um, many kings had, had come and gone, and most of them, if not all of them, have not really done that well with their position. They themselves had sinned. They had led also uh, Israel and Judah, respectively, into sin. They weren't living according to the ways that God had instructed them to live. As a consequence of that, they were under constant warfare and struggle with other nations around them that wanted to squash them. And so there were just all of these macro forces that is the backdrop to this poor widow who personally was having a very difficult time, but also in a bigger sense, Israel was having a pretty difficult time. I don't know if you've ever felt this way about like the economy or the real estate market or the job market. It just feels sometimes like there are these powers and these forces in the world that try as I might, I just can't do anything about. And I'm just like at the whim of these big old powers and I'm caught in the current of the way that the world is going and there's really just not much that I can do. Now you compound that with having personal challenge and you're beginning to understand the picture of where this poor woman is, is coming from, where she's been living her life. Um, so let's read the episode. It's just the first seven verses, and, um, and then we'll go back through and dissect it, as is my habit. Chapter 4, verse 1. Now a certain woman of the wives of the sons of the prophets cried out to Elisha, Your servant, my husband, is dead, and you know that your servant feared the Lord. And the creditor has come to take my, new, my two children to be his slaves. And Elisha said to her, what shall I do for you? Tell me, what do you have in your house? And she said, your maidservant has nothing in the house except the jar of oil. 
Then he said, okay, go borrow vessels at large for yourself from all your neighbors, even empty vessels. Do not get a few. And you shall go in and shut the door behind you and your sons and pour out into all these vessels. And you shall set aside what is full. So she went from him and shut the door behind her and her sons. And they were bringing the vessels to her, and she poured. And it came about when the vessels were full that she said to her son, bring me another vessel. And he said to her, there is not one vessel more. And the oil stopped. And then she came and told the man of God, and he said, go, sell the oil and pay your debt, and you and your sons can live on the rest. I really love this story. I love it because it's so tender. I don't know if this has ever happened to you as you're reading your Bible, um, especially for a little short episode like this. Sometimes I can read so fast, I kind of gloss over some details um, that are really significant. And so I want to go back through and point out some of the things that stood out to me as I was thinking about this and, and seeking the Lord. Okay, God, what does this mean? How, how can we use this in our, in our lives? So the first thing that I want to start with is verse 1. Now, a certain woman of the wives of the sons of the prophets, stop right there. So what does that mean, sons of the prophets? Well, there was this group of people who were being trained, were totally dedicated to kind of the office of the prophet. And they're called sons of the prophet, not because necessarily they were like the flesh and blood of the prophet. And back in those days, it really wasn't like it is now, because the Holy Spirit did not dwell in everyone's spirit back then, Uh, like it does now for those who believe in Jesus. Uh, But because Jesus died and rose again and he sent his spirit, now we can have his Holy Spirit living inside of us, but it wasn't like that back then. And so having uh, the Holy Spirit speak to somebody and and to speak out prophetically or to pray prophetically was a, a much more rare occurrence than it is these days. And so there was a a whole group of the nation of Israel that dedicated themselves to being trained in, uh, supporting, and just living and breathing, basically, um, the the prophet. And even before there were any kings in Israel, the prophet kind of was the person who was leading, uh, leading leading the nation. They would be the person through which the word of God most often would come. I'm kind of overstating a little bit, but just to make a point that um, you can't exactly uh, uh, take what is the reality for us now because we live in a different age because we live, we're living after Jesus died and rose again, whereas they were living before that. But nevertheless, this woman and her late husband were a part of this group of people who you can kind of think about it this way. They were in the ministry. They were just all about ministry. And do you know what I thought? I thought, good for her that she didn't let the fact that she had been living and breathing and being in ministry stop her from going to her spiritual leader and say, I'm not doing okay. That made me think about just the fact that there are thousands of reasons probably why any one of us would not want to go to somebody and say, I need help, I'm not doing well. And... I just, I don't exactly understand why this is. I mean, I have some hunches, but I don't, I don't fully understand it, I don't think. And I've said this before. How, how has church become like one of the last places where you can be vulnerable, open, and honest about what's going on in your life? That's crazy to me. It's madness. And especially, there's this weird trend that the longer you're in the church and the more that you're in leadership the less that you can be honest and vulnerable about what's going on in your life, the less that you can admit that you need help, the less, in, that, the, the less that you can, without fear of reprisal or backlash or shame or I don't know, share, I'm really struggling with this. That is the opposite of what it should be. Church and the people of God should be the one place where you can bring things honestly. You can bear your heart. You can say, this is what's happening in my life. And not be afraid of that. And I get it to a certain degree because maybe people have tried to be open to someone, to an authority figure, and they just got eviscerated. Or maybe they got dismissed. Or maybe they got made fun of or whatever it is. And so that can really close a person up to want to you know, share honestly what's going on in them. But I find in my heart, even um, not really having experienced many of those horrible things, I would say, in my own life, I still find that trend that I need to be purposeful about sharing this is really what's going on in my life. 
And if I'm going to make room for God in the midst of my need, I have to be willing to be open and honest, first of all, with God. Second of all, with people who are my spiritual leaders, other people who I know can speak into my life. And it's a scary thing. It's a totally scary thing. We don't know exactly why this woman was in debt, but we know that it was severe enough and, and the debt was high enough that the creditor was like, well, I need to get paid, so I'm going to come and take the only valuable thing that you have left, which are your sons. You just think about, just, can you just think about that for a second? I think about this poor woman. You know, widows, widows back in, in, in those days, they were some of the most vulnerable people in society. Widows and orphans were like the two most vulnerable people in society because they didn't have that many options for caring for themselves, providing for themselves. I mean, basic stuff like food and shelter. And, and back in those days, especially, the, the husband was kind of the covering and the, and the main person who would be able to provide for his family. And so you wouldn't see many women CEOs back in those days, put it that way, okay? Whereas these days, if, if, if a woman has experienced that sort of tragedy, there are some societal options for them that they could go and get a job, and, and that's you know, not something that would be strange. But back then, those kinds of things wouldn't happen. And so it doesn't say if you know, their family was in debt before the husband died or she got into debt after he died trying to provide for her family. But whatever the reason, she's completely in debt, probably out of like all the options she has. And she goes to Elisha from my reading of the story, almost as like a a last ditch effort, which makes me kind of wonder, had she gone to Elisha before it became so desperate, would she have avoided some of the trouble and some of the challenge that she had faced in her life? Whatever compels you to go talk to somebody about what's really going on in your life, I say amen and hallelujah for that. But you don't have to wait, folks, until you're like utterly desperate and have no options. And so I guess I'll talk to that person about it. Now, I'm talking about the kind of stuff that's going on in your life after you close your front door. When you look at yourself in the mirror, what really goes on upstairs, those are the things that I'm talking about your home, the stuff that really goes on in your life? Do you have someone that you can be honest and open about those things with, that you can share? Have you ever been freaked out by a thought you had? Like, whoa, uh, 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 what was that? And even you could recognize, like, that was not good. That was not a good thought. And then it happens again, uh, freaks you out even more. And then maybe you realize, I think I'm being driven by this. I think I'm afraid of that, and that's why I'm doing these things. But if you keep it all to yourself, I'm telling you, you're not going to be making as much room for God as if you had invited other people into that process with you. Who is the Elisha in your life? Who has that sort of spiritual authority that you could go to and say, I don't know what to do. Can you help me? How often do you talk to somebody like that and say, I don't know what to do? Can I be honest and vulnerable with you for a second? Good, I'm going to. Um, I shared this first service, and it's recorded, so I might as well share it with you. Can, Can I tell you? I do that about twice a week. I go to someone who I know can speak into my life, and I say something along the lines of, I don't really know what to do. Can you help me? about like twice a week. So how frequent do you do that? How frequently are you inviting the word of God through other established spiritual authorities into your life? And if the answer is like once a year, I would urge you to reevaluate that pattern of life. Now, I'm not trying to shame you into this. Look what happened to this woman, okay? She got a bunch of oil where she could pay off the debt and live for the rest of her life on from bringing somebody else in on this. So I want to I wanna get into that a little bit now. Um, okay, your servant, my husband, is dead, and you know that your servant feared the Lord, and the creditor has come to take my two children to be his slaves. And Elisha said to her, what shall I do for you? Tell me, what do you have in the, in, in the house? Now, okay, I'm kind of reading the text here a little bit, but this is my interpretation of Elisha. I don't think he knew what to do. I think he was like, yeah, that is bad. 
you, you do need some money. <laughs> you got to pay that guy off for sure. No pockets. Um, <laughs> I, don't, I don't have a 20 on me. I'm sorry. I don't have anything. I, I don't know what to give you. And so if, if you are a person who you, you want to be someone, you want to be a spiritual authority, you want to be someone who can speak into a person's life and, and, and bring them life and, and help guide them, this is a really great thing to pay attention to. I think Elisha didn't really know what to do, but what did he do? He just asked her another personal question about her life and then listened. I do this all the time. A couple of people told me like, wow, you really listen well. Well, now you know why, because I'm clueless. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, that does sound bad. Oh God, help me. <laughs> what are you saying? Nothing. Tell me a little bit more about that situation in your life. Give me some more details, please. And I just wait and I wait and I wait until they say something, bink, and I hear something from the Lord and then I'll say something. So I'll just wait and I'll listen until I hear something from God. And I'll ask some personal questions about, can you tell me a little bit more about this? Or, you know, have you thought about that? And give me your perspective on this sort of thing. And a lot of the time, I'm just waiting for God to say something to me. So it's kind of a funny skill to develop because you totally want to listen to the person and, and you know, you, you want to make sure that they understand that you're listening to them and not like, yeah, tell me about that. <sighs> I know, I know. I'm, I'm listening too. I don't know what to do about this. <laughs> what was that? Oh, okay. You, you have to, <laughs> you know, you have to make sure they know you're listening, but also to have an ear to the heavens to be listening for what God might want to speak into this situation. And so sometimes when I don't know what to do as a disciple or a counselor, I just ask some more questions. Um, so Elisha is like, yeah, what should I do for you? So what do you have in your house? Have you thought about a yard sale? I don't know. <laughs> and she said, can you hear the desperation in this poor woman's voice? She's like, your maidservant, I have nothing. I have nothing in my house. I make except for that one jar of oil. But other than that, I have nothing. And that was the thing that Elisha needed. He's like, huh, a jar of oil. Ah, okay, all right, this is what you should do. Go to all your neighbor's house. It says, borrow at large from your neighbors, even the empty vessels, and do not get a few. Go out and find all of the empty vessels, all the pots and pans, all the jars, everything that could hold liquid. Go get it from your neighbors. The, st the plot thickens. Interesting. She was honest, open, and vulnerable with one person. And then his advice was, now go be honest, open, and vulnerable with many other people. It's made me think of the scripture in Proverbs that says, in abundance of counselors, there is victory. Look, I'm not trying to smack you over the head with this, but guys, either the Bible is true or it's not. You can't pick and choose. So if the Bible teaches us that in abundance of counselors, there is victory, what happens with not that many counselors then? Defeat. I love that verse, and it's almost like a life verse of mine because there was a period in my life when I just didn't want anybody to help me. You could ask my mom after service. I didn't want anyone to help me with my homework. I just like, nah, nah, nah. and I see that in my children too these days a little bit, you know, trying to help them put on a jacket or something simple like that. And like, no, I can do it myself. And I'm like, whoa, I want you to grow and I want you to mature. I don't want you to be somehow like strangely dependent on me. You know, you're 23 years old and like, oh, I'm cold. I got to call my dad to put a jacket on me. <laughs> Weird. <laughs> but I could feel there's something else in that in my kids. I want to do it myself. And I want to teach them that it's healthy to have some sort of connection with other people and reliance on other people. Um, to, to, to help them in life, and that they don't have to be a lone ranger, so to speak. So can you imagine this poor woman? She, I mean, imagine the embarrassment. You can't even provide for your family, and you're going around asking for empty jars. Does that strike you as strange? She's not like, go get a bunch of jam from your neighbors, and maybe that can feed your kids. Like, go get empty things. I'm sure at least one person said, why do you need my empty jars again? Well, um... God told me he's going to fill it miraculously. Okay. Okay, here. Imagine the vulnerability and the awkwardness of her telling all of her neighbors this is what's going on. But guys, that is what I think 
a healthy Christian life looks like. Now, we can't get crazy about this, and you know, I, I don't want you to just be popping up in the middle of service and say, yes, I've just been waiting to tell people about all of my intense personal intimate struggles, and I'm just so happy for everyone to know that. You know, that's, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about having personal connection with people that's so deep that you could go to them and ask them for something that could help you in that situation. But you know what I love about this? He says, go get empty things from people. And what happens after that? God fills those vessels. Even when you go to someone and you receive counsel, you receive a scripture from them, you still need God to fill that. Otherwise, it's just an empty vessel still. Does that make sense what I'm saying? There's something still for you to do. Even if someone speaks a scripture right to your heart, you take that. It's still somewhat empty. You bring it to the Lord and say, God, help me fill this up in my life so that it becomes life to me and to my family. There's an engagement. There's some sort of simple obedience of engaging in the things that other people are able to bring to your life that you need God to fill those things. And folks, if you're a person who loves to counsel people, if you want to be somebody who disciples people, remember that you're only ever giving them empty jars, and you still need the Holy Spirit to fill that empty jar of your good advice to be useful for that person. That's why I don't like using the word advice, because it just, for me, it has a connotation of like, I don't know, you don't have money, so you should probably sell some stuff, I guess. That's advice. But counsel, spiritual counsel is get empty jars, God will fill them up, and then you can sell that oil and live on that. That's spiritual advice. Because it brings people to a work of faith, not a work of flesh. A work of flesh would be maybe you should sell your house and you could pay it off. A work of faith is bring this to God, he'll do something, and then you'll be able to move on from there. That's the difference. So when we are giving people even, even counsel, it still needs to be filled by God. I hope I'm making myself clear. Does that kind of make sense? So without the Holy Spirit, even a scripture, I believe this wholeheartedly, even delivering a scripture to someone without the Holy Spirit filling that thing, it's not going to mean much. I can't tell you how many times I've had conversations with people who are like, Evan, that sounds great. I've tried that whole be vulnerable and like talk to people about it. Didn't help me. Didn't help me at all. And I'll tell you what my first thought is, what did you do with those words? Did you bring them to God and say, I don't get it, but can you fill this for me? Because it still kind of feels like empty advice. And most of the time I have found that the answer is they're not really engaging in the word. They're just wanting God to be some magic vending machine like, I'll take a Coke, please, and some candy with that. And they're just looking for God to like, and change it all. But this woman had to be vulnerable with her neighbors and do something with what God, do something in that process. I love that what God had for her to do was totally doable, completely approachable, not intimidating. It might have required for her to get over herself a little bit, get over her pride or embarrassment and go around and get empty jars from people. But above and beyond that, it wasn't like, you need to memorize Leviticus, okay? <laughs> then and only then will your jar be full, you know? It's not like these unattainable, ridiculous requirements that you know you'll fail in. Like, go and be perfect, child. Then God will do something for you. That's not the kind of stuff that God will instruct us to do. I would love our church to be like a neighborhood of people with empty jars in our house. Knock on the door, open it up. I'm not doing great. I need help. Is there, anything, is there anything that you can do that would help me? And we can just deliver all our empty jars to them. And as we, as the neighbors, would believe, Lord, would you fill this for them in their life? As I deliver to them, as I give them this counsel, as I give this scripture to them, Lord, would you fill it in their life? And then for people who are receiving these empty jars, that you would have the wherewithal, the awareness, and the purposefulness to go to God by yourself. Why do you think he says, go shut the door behind you? This is not meant to be a public thing. You go in your house, your home, where you're really living. When you're staring yourself in the mirror, you go to that place, and you bring these things to the Lord, and you say, I need this to be filled, God. I'm at my most vulnerable in this place. And if you don't do this, I'm done for. 
That's how you make room for God. It's with other people, but it's also private. So she went from him and shut the door with her sons, and, and she's pouring the oil, pouring the oil, pouring the oil. And her sons are bringing him. She said, hey, bring me another one. And one of her sons says, it's, it's, they're all gone. They're done. And right then, the oil stopped. It's beautiful, right? Great. What if she had gone to twice as many neighbors? <laughs> In abundance of counselors, there is victory. What if she got to twice as many neighbors? Think about, just for a second, just in your mind's eye, think about all of the pots and pans in your house right now, whether they're our roommates or they're yours or whatever. Think about every single thing that could hold liquid. Now think about all the people in this room. If you were such close friends with them and you could go to their house and bring like a big old truck and gather all the containers, imagine how many, imagine the volume of oil you could have to your name. That, my friends, is the difference between living your life by yourself before the Lord and living your life in a community of believers that you can draw on in your life. That's the difference. Now, I'm not going to sit up here and say, well, you can't hear God unless it comes through other people. That's not true. You have a Holy Spirit if you believe in Jesus Christ, that he died and, and died for your sin and rose again. You have a Holy Spirit. You can hear from God. But I'm telling you that there's something of a richness, an increase of the flow of kingdom activity in your life if you allow other people to be in that. It's one of the reasons why I love small groups is because that is a great expression or venue for having other people to be able to speak into your life and blow your mind. You have an opportunity to speak into somebody else's life. It doesn't have to just happen in a small group. It can happen um, in any number of settings But the point is, do you have those kinds of people in your life? And how often are you going to them with need? If you really evaluated what you, just the trouble and the challenge that you have in your life, how often are you going to these people? Abundance of counselors, there's victory. The oil stopped. Verse 7, then she came and told the man of God, and he said, go sell the oil, pay your debt, and you and your sons can live in the rest. (laughs) I love this idea. Not only does God rescue us from our trouble, not only does he deliver us from our challenge, but he sets us up with so much oil after the fact that we can live moving forward. And I felt this by the, by the Lord in the first service, and I'll say it again, that I think, no, no, let me say that again. I believe the Lord is saying to some people here that the reason why God has not allowed for the flow of oil in your life is because you have not gathered enough jars yet. And it is, it is his mercy that he hasn't poured out that resource and satisfied that thing in your heart, hasn't answered that prayer because you're so focused on the two jars that you were able to bring by yourself. And God's like, that's not gonna be enough for the rest of your life. So go and gather more jars, and then you will experience the free flowing of the oil of the resource of God in your life. And it won't just deliver you out of the thing you're focused on right now. It'll be for you and your family moving forward. So not just your own mind or your own self, but it's your home. It's your sphere of influence that gets blessed that way. There's a scripture in Proverbs that says, Hope deferred makes a heart sick, but desire fulfilled is a tree of life. The idea is that when you have a hope, when you have a dream, when you have a prayer that has not been answered and the answer has been deferred, it has delayed, it, you've been waiting for so long, it makes you sick because of the place that you're in because that hope hasn't been fulfilled. But when that desire gets fulfilled, it becomes for that kind of person, not just an apple in that moment, you can eat on it, tasty, thank you very much, but it is a tree of life that continues growing and provides life for you in that moment and moving forward from there. If you do a Bible study on trees, it's really interesting. There's so much reference to how the branches of the trees extend so far, and they provide shade for the animals and other people to come who are being scorched by the heat of their life. And they can come to the tree of your life, and they can find a shelter, and they have a place for it. But I'm telling you, friends, it only happens if you let God in on your places of need. And I'm saying that what the Bible teaches us is that happens in the concert and community of other people in your life. If you have ambition in the kingdom to be someone who could bless another, to be someone who could make a place for somebody else, I'm telling you it starts in your need. And it starts by having a community. Get those empty jars. 
and then you'll see the oil flow. Last thing I want to make, uh, last point I want to make, <laughs> the last point I want to make is, as, as the Lord put this, this uh, episode on my heart to teach from it, I, I just can never remember, I have such a hard time remembering the difference between Elisha, who we just read about, and Elijah. It's like the meanest name combo of all time. Like, there should just be a rule. If you disciple someone, they cannot have a name that sounds like yours. Because it's just confusing. And I'm like, oh, who did it? Was it Elijah or Elisha? Well, it turns out that this was definitely the episode I was thinking of. So it's Elisha who did it. But did you know that Elijah also did a miracle that was very similar? There was a widow who was going to the well. She was gathering some sticks. She was going to prepare a fire to make the last cake from the flour that she had to prepare for her and her son to die. Same sort of situation. Desperate widow, has no recourse, has an encounter with a prophet. Elijah says to that widow, bake a cake and give it to me, and then you'll see that the flour in the jar of oil will never stop. And sure enough, God did that. And I thought, wow, this is actually a really beautiful expression of true discipleship. Discipleship is not something where you become a carbon copy of somebody else or a robotic version, like you become exactly like that person. But when you're discipled by somebody, your ministry bears some similarity to the person that you were discipled by. That's not a bad thing. You know, some people have said like, oh, Evan, you remind me of, of, of your mom or your dad. And I'm like, thank you. And not just because they're my mom and my dad, but because they discipled me. So that's actually very encouraging to me. Like, oh, I've actually been discipled. That's encouraging. That's how it's supposed to work. And for people who like, they just, I don't know, some people aren't really thinking and they're like, you know, I don't know, don't you, do you feel like a pressure to like be like your dad or be like your mom or whatever? And I'm like, no. I don't feel a pressure to be my own man. You don't have to be your own woman, be your own man. Guess what? Newsflash, you're not. You know that, right? You belong to Christ. So when he thought, well, I want to be my own man, I want to be my own woman, I want to do my own thing, and, you know, oh, I don't want to look like what happened before. I don't know. Where's that coming from? We all belong to Christ. So I'm his bondservant. But I just love that we have this beautiful chain of relationships. By the way, that all starts with Jesus, right? Remember him? Jesus discipled a bunch of guys who discipled a bunch of people who discipled bop, 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 who discipled Daniel and Pamela Brown who discipled me. It's a beautiful chain of similarity. And that's how we get to grow into all things into Christ Jesus because we've been discipled by people who look like Christ. So I just thought it was such a beautiful thing that I, I saw that and I, I realized, wow, Elisha and Elijah have more similarity than just how their names sound. I think that's a cool thing. So, that's it. <laughs> I'm having a hard time with segues this morning. The end. Let's pray. <laughs> oh, Lord. I thank you. I thank you, God for how you provide for us through other people in our lives. Lord, I want to pray for people who are facing something in their life right now that's too big for them. And I pray that you would give them the courage, Lord. Speak to them about whatever is that barrier that's holding them back from wanting to talk to somebody else about it. Show them what it is, Lord. And if there needs to be repentance, let there be repentance. If there needs to be deliverance, let them be delivered, Lord but give them the courage to speak up about what's really going on in their minds at their home. And Lord, for those who are available to give out empty jars, I pray that they would do it with faithfulness. And for them as well, that they would have the courage to believe that you can fill what they are able to give. And church, I just wanna to say to you that you might be feeling like I can't give much, and what I have to give feels so empty. And what I want to say to you is you're right on track because God is the one who fills those things. So Lord, fill those empty jars as they exchange hands. And I pray for the overflowing resource of your oil to just pour down into our lives and that it would be as a tree of life is 
something that grows on and on and on and on and provides life and provides shelter, not just for us, but for the people around us. May we be your orchard, O oh Lord, of growing trees that many people could come to the coastlands and find shelter, find food. But I know it starts with our need, Lord, and there's plenty of that. So take our need and transform it into something that is beautiful. Answer our prayers, fulfill our desires, Lord, that we could be people who have trees of life. I pray in your name, Jesus. Amen. Amen. All right. Bless you. We'll see you next week. Don't forget to sign up for a work party on and through October. And we'll see. Oh, there's a barbecue after this. So if you like that, stick around, would you? All right. See you.